the Menai Straits is one of the most difficult um, stretches of water in the world to navigate. And Admiral Lord Nelson said that if you could navigate the Menai Straits, you could navigate anywhere in the world. Now, the reason for that is it's a dual current system and uh, the tide comes in from both the Carnarvon end and the Banga and the Banga side. And what happens is it meets in the middle, literally. And there's an area where the two tides meet, which are called the swellies. And it's whirlpools, eddies, all sorts of problems for shipping. Thousands of ships have gone down uh, over the years in the strait, and particularly on an area called the Lavan Sands, which again we'll be coming back to. That is an actual picture of a shipwreck, or at least a recreation of a shipwreck, uh, in 1819, uh, just when the bridge uh, was being started. So it's a very, very old place. It's a place of great antiquity. The strait itself isn't maybe as old as you'd, uh, you'd think. It's 5,000 years old, cut by uh, glacial rocks as they came through, and they created this channel, uh, which we now call the Menai Strait. Um, that is a, a, an old burial chamber called Bryn Cethi near that place with a very, very long name, which I'm not going to say at the moment. And Brinkettley D was used as a burial chamber. And it's also, uh, there was a stone circle on the outside. It's probably around 3,500 years old. Uh, and it's probably about the same time as the construction um, of, uh, of Stonehenge. After the, uh, after the construction of Brinkettley D, another group of people, the Celts came and they settled in the area. And the Celtic culture, the Druid culture, became incredibly important, not just uh, for Anglesey, but for the whole of Britain. And the reason for that, again, is the Menai Strait. Anglesey was isolated, it was cut off. That was good in some respects, because it meant that the culture could grow, uh, but it also meant in certain ways that it was indeed culturally isolated. Nevertheless, the Druids on Anglesey were incredibly important people. It was basically a center of learning, and it was also a place where um, people used to come um, for spiritual solace on the island itself. Of course, it was all by sea and it was all about uh, crossing uh, either by a ferry, very small cargoes of ferries, or by slightly larger boats. Anglesey continued more or less unchanged uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years. And then the Great Awakening happened uh, in AD 61. The, German, so the Roman leader called Suetonius Paulinus um, came up to Anglesey. Now, the notion of this was that the Romans had to defeat the Celts, they had to defeat the Druids in order to be able to overcome the whole of Britain, Anglesey being the spiritual capital. So it was massively important, and Suetonius Paulinus marched up what became Watling Street, the A5 as it is now, and uh, came across to the Isle of Anglesey. There's a historian called Tacitus, and Tacitus uh, basically left a record of what happened during the Roman invasion. Uh, on the left hand side of the again, fairly fanciful picture is the, uh, the defense, that's the, uh, the Druids on Anglesey, trying to defend Anglesey from the invading Romans. And on the right hand side, those boats are probably fanciful. Um, there's a huge question really, is who put a bridge across the Menai Strait first? And the answer is the Romans, and it's also at this particular period. So it wasn't huge galleons like that. Basically, they used flat bottom conical style boats, and they turned them upside down and they lashed them together. And the infantry went across on the bridge, on the pontoon bridge, and the cavalry um, swam across with the horses. So basically, uh, there were two attacks on Anglesey. The first time, they were actually driven back by the Druids, terrified of the, of the Druids. The Romans were scared, and they drew back. And three years later, they re-attacked, and they took the island of Anglesey, and they chased the Druids into their sacred oak forests. And there was a massive slaughter. And all across the island, there are places with uh, the Welsh word for red, Koch, such as Triath Koch, uh, the Red Beach. And this is where the blood, allegedly, of the Druids uh, was spilt. The Romans stayed around the area for uh, around 350 years, and there was no peace after that, because basically the second bunch of people to arrive uh, were the Norse. And the first uh, attack on Anglesey was in 683. What they did actually was they settled the area. There are lots of homesteads, there are lots of evidence of, uh, of uh, Norse homesteads in the area, 
but also there, there are a lot of uh, raids coming from Ireland and coming from the Isle of Man. The Romans gave Anglesey its, uh, its Welsh name, Mona, Unis Mon, uh, and it was the Vikings that gave Anglesey its allegedly English name. It's the Say or the Island of Ongol, uh, who was one of the, the Viking leaders. And the last great battle um, with the Vikings was called the Battle of Menai Bridge, uh, the Battle of Porth Aethwy. And uh, that took place in 1098. And the situation was then that the Normans had arrived and the battle wasn't between the Welsh princes uh, and, the, and the Norse people, it was between the Normans. And the Normans won, but basically because there was such a, a huge battle there, uh, it, uh, it, it reinstated the power of the Welsh princes. And that carried on for, again, uh, a couple of centuries. If we're talking about crossing the strait and the bridges themselves and the Romans, the coracles were the first, uh, the first attempt to, to build a bridge, the first medium term bridge that went across uh, was in 1282. And that was built by the forces of Edward I. The Welsh princes had risen again and Edward I decided that he was gonna build a series of castles. And basically they called it the Stone Fortress all the way around North Wales, all the way around Gwynedd. And what he had to do then, uh, he went on to Anglesey and he captured part of Anglesey and he wanted to uh, attack uh, Snowdonia, attack, uh, attack Gwynedd. So there were two separate ways he went across. He was gonna have a pincer movement, one going across the Lavan Sands, uh, which is near Carnarvon, and one going across uh, a pontoon bridge. And there's been some speculation as to where the pontoon bridge was originally. Uh, it was, this was called the Battle of Moila Don, but Moila Don as an area has been discounted as the area where the, the actual battle took place. The general who led uh, Edward I's troops was called Luke de Taney. He was from Gascoigne. And largely this was a battle, not of uh, English in inverted commas, but of Norse, uh, sorry, Normans against the, uh, against the Welsh princes and particularly uh, Llewellyn ap Griffith. So the pontoon bridge was built and uh, it was secured. It was there for about three months and the English troops poured across and they went across to the mainland and were driven back by the Welsh. And at that point, they tried to get onto the pontoon bridge again, and the weight of, the, uh, of the, all the, uh, uh, the, the armor and the horses caused the bridge to collapse. The bridgehead went down into the water, and there were literally hundreds of, uh, of uh, English soldiers drowned. It put the war back uh, by about two or three years. It was a massive setback for the forces of, uh, of Edward I. It's called the Battle of the Bridges, and the actual site of it, is here, um, just to give you some uh, indication where we are. This is Menai Bridge here. This is both A3, the old name for Menai Bridge. And this is the channel, the strait that goes up towards Bromaris and then to the open sea. And the, the, uh, uh, the pontoon bridge was in all probability across here. If anybody's been to the area, it's more or less where Bangor Pier is today. Commerce and trade, massively important. And uh, over the centuries, um, particularly around the, uh, after the, the 14th century, a massive amount of cattle uh, grazed on the, uh, on the, uh, on, on the Anglesey side. Um, there had to be some way of getting them across and what they did was they actually swam them. Uh, it's recorded that in 1818, 15,000 cattle were swum across the straits. Many hundreds of them were drowned. Um, they didn't all safely get across, but nevertheless, that was a cheaper way of getting uh, the cattle across and by, by taking them across on the ferry. Uh, Anglesey, and this Mon, was known as Mon Mam Cymru, which means Anglesey, the mother of Wales, and that's because it was so fertile. So a lot of trade, a lot of commerce, and a lot of things to get across the strait. So an increasing uh, a motivation <clears throat> for somebody to actually get a bridge to go across. And there are proposals for bridges going back centuries throughout the, uh, throughout the, uh, throughout the ages. ages. It was so important, this, uh, this, this place where the, the cattle would swim across, that it became a cattle market and it was a fair, and the fair was sponsored by the, uh, by the Bishop of Bangor. And this is uh, Menai Bridge about 20 years ago, and this is the vest the, the, what's left of the old cattle market, the old cattle fair that was, uh, that was held in Menai Bridge. So there wasn't much going on in terms of population in the town, but it was a very, very important uh, potential bridgehead. 
And when I say there's not much going on, that's a very uh, sort of like uh, a, a rough outline map uh, of Menai Bridge, which is in that area, called Aethwy again. And this is 1818 before the, uh, the, before the Menai Bridge was commenced. And all you can see is a couple of tracks going across to the local chapels and churches. Uh, there's a ferry house there and there's a couple of stables, etc., and so forth. So it's the narrowest port point of the strait. That's the important part. It's very, very narrow at that point, but it does have these massive rise and fall uh, of, of tides. Um, that painting is really interesting. Uh, Tish, it's in the um, National uh, Library of Wales in, in Aberystwyth. And um, it's basically showing, it is an actual uh, painting of the site of the Menai Bridge. It's coincidental, it wasn't painted because it was the site of the Menai Bridge. It was painted to commemorate uh, two of the ferries, two of the eight ferries that actually went across. And here's the clarion caller here. And what he's doing is he's informing people in this building here, which is the Cambria Inn, and this is still on site, this is still existing, uh, that there are two ferries coming across. Now, this is the smaller one. This carries obviously uh, people up to about 10. And the larger ferry itself is the mail ferry. And we thought originally when we saw this particular engraving, this painting, uh, that this was uh, a rock. But the more you look at it, it is a ferry. And this is a stagecoach. This is the Royal Mail coach that was ferried across and the wheels were taken off. And when it was, uh, when it was taken across onto the, uh, the Anglesey shore, uh, the wheels were fitted again and stopped at the Cambria Inn and off to, to Hollyhead. Another interesting thing about this is that this part here is the swellies. This is where these enormous currents go. And this area here is slightly uh, less prone to these massive currents, but, and it is, like I say, the, the narrowest point. So a uh, huge, huge clamor to get a bridge going across. People aren't uh, keen to use the ferries. They're ripped off left, right, and center. And also there's a fair number of them actually sink and a number of people are drowned. So it's not the best solution to getting across the strait. A um, couple of engineers in the early 19th century begin to look at this. Rennie and Jessup are brought in to have a look at how a, a bridge could possibly be put across. One of the proposals is for an embankment to go across at this point here and a, an arch bridge there in the center and then another embankment there. But the key uh, to all this is the Admiralty because the Admiralty need uh, 100 feet uh, headroom to get mast, full masted sailing ships underneath any bridge which is constructed. So this is quite an important island. This is called Unasimoch. Uh, it's Pig Island and it's allegedly where pigs were rested when they were swam across uh, to go to the markets on this side. But that became uh, basically the, the kind of feature that would take the, the first arch of any bridge that was built because it's pretty much halfway across the strait. Local entrepreneurs got involved. This is Henry Paget, the first uh, Marquis of Anglesey, and he agitated for a bridge to go across, uh, across the Menai Strait at, uh, at Menai. Uh, there were lots of other proposals. People from Carnarvon wanted it further down the coast on Carnarvon, but eventually Paget um, succeeded. And the, the guy that uh, the government called him, because this was a government-sponsored scheme, eventually was Thomas Telford. Um, Telford, an amazingly successful engineer, been involved in all sorts of projects. He'd built schools and he'd built, uh, he'd, he'd, he'd built bridges in the past. But his, uh, his, his masterpiece was the Ponte Silti Aqueduct, um, which is around Shrewsbury area and the top of, top of North Wales. And uh, that was a stunning piece of engineering. And the person he used for the, the ironwork on it was a guy called William Hazeldine. So Telford is already in, uh, in partnership with William Hazeldine, and he then uh, becomes again, he gets another partner um, who's the, the site engineer called William Provis. So they appoint Telford, and Telford has a huge problem. He doesn't know how to, he doesn't really know how to begin with this. Um, he's got a notion that he's going to build a suspension bridge. But the longest suspension bridge in the world uh, prior to the Menai Bridge here was something like 40 yards long, absolutely tiny. And there was no precedence whatsoever. The other thing is, where is he going to get his stone from? Uh, there are various quarries around this area. This is Porthaithwy, this is Menai Bridge here. This is Porthaithwy Ferry that we've just seen. Uh, and the original idea was to get some stones and rocks from around this area. 
uh, proved to be impractical. And what they had to do was to go all the way up the coast here to Penmon Priory and around here to Titherith Point. And that's where they, they set up the major quarry. So huge, huge barges then had to bring the stone all the way around. And the foundation stone was laid on the 10th of August, 1819. This is the actual stone being quarried at uh, what's known as Trithkoch Red Wolf Bay, and then ready to be taken around the coast. So uh, 10th of August, 2019, we celebrated 200 years of the laying of the foundation stone. And uh, that's Bob Damon's uh, much missed Bob. He was our senior trustee here, our chair for many, many years. So we had a relaying ceremony. We recreated the, uh, the foundation stone there. And the foundation stone was laid originally there. And I have to say the 10th of August, 2019 was almost as bad a weather as the 10th of August, 1819. You can see that it nearly blew away on many, many occasions as we're trying to unveil the stone. So the issue that Telford had, and I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'm conscious now of the time a little bit, uh, we'll, I'll come to a, a fairly swift conclusion, is that he had to build not only a bridge, but also huge embankments going across on both sides of the strait. And what he did is he built up the stones from the, uh, from the quarry up and up and up. And this is, as I, I said before we actually started, this is what Telford called a pyramid. This is the main tower of the bridge. So the arches were uh, completed, the pyramid was completed, and then temporary wooden slats, wooden structure uh, was put up, scaffolding, in order to hang the chains. So this took place between 1819 and 1824. Uh, 1825, they started to lift the chains, and this is where it got really, really difficult. Not that it wasn't difficult here, uh, it's already two years behind schedule. But at this point, uh, they have to get the chains and the, the shifting of the chains exactly right. So this is what they did. Uh, they lifted the first chain, stored about two miles away, brought it down on barges and hung the, hung the chain over the top. And the same then on the, uh, on the Bangor shore, uh, lifted the, the chain down there. Then the main chains, and there are four of these, were actually taken on enormous, massive, massive, massive uh, barges. They were six feet wide and 400 feet long. And each of the chains was laid on there and then literally by hand, because there was no steam power in those days, by capstan, winch and winch and winch and winch, until gradually the chains were at that level going across the strait. This is from Dr. Doolittle. You know the film Dr. Doolittle? It came out about six months ago, not a great success, but it was filmed at the, uh, at the bridge and they reconstructed for a different part of the film how it would have looked like building the bridge with schooners going underneath it. Uh, like I say, it's a bit of chronology, but it's quite a nice photograph uh, to give a bit of context. So when the bridge was uh, finished, the bridge was completed. Uh, now there are two sets of chains. It was altered in 1938, but originally there were these four, and you can see on the top here, these saddles uh, that took, the, uh, took, the, took the, the, the chains across. The main carriageway is here and here. And down the center is a walkway, but our guests there don't seem to be paying much attention to that. They're actually posing and sitting on the main roadway itself. So 1826, uh, January the 23rd, 1826, the bridge was opened. And this is the final one, because again, I'm conscious of the time. Uh, just to give you some idea again, very quickly, of uh, Telford's engineering feat and William Provis's engineering feat, that from there to there is the distance of the largest, longest suspension bridge in the world before the Menai was completed. And this is the distance now. And just to, to wrap it up and say that it remained uh, the longest suspension bridge, biggest suspension bridge in the world until 1864. Oh, sorry, in Britain until 1864 and with the opening of, uh, of the Clifton Suspension Bridge. Thank you.